rocks. It's kind of a play on words. Uh, Yes, Rock Point Church, if it's your church, it does rock. And I'm so glad that if you found your tribe, you found your vibe. Uh, Because we are made up as the church of Jesus Christ. We're made up of um, all kinds of different people, all kinds of different places, all kinds of different buildings make up the church of Jesus Christ. And yet, inside of that holy nation, that church of people, back in the day, was uh, 12 tribes that came from Jacob. You had the tribe of Asher, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Judah, and all of them had a certain particular vein in which they did their thing, and it all made this huge tapestry in which God could show himself strong. And I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of churches here in Rapid City and a lot of churches around the nation and the world right now that are meeting at this time and at other times. And thank God we're a part of the big body that Jesus calls my church. But yet, here at Rock Point Church, we have our own vein. We got our own tribe and we're doing our thing. And if you feel like this is your home church, then plug in. And guess what? My church rocks and his church rocks. (laughs) And we're all a part of that big church. And so it's been great to be able to talk about what God's doing in the church. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I want to say this, that without the kingdom, the church has no relevancy. And I want to expound upon that statement here throughout this message In Matthew 16, we see where Jesus comes to his disciples and he says the famous, who do men say that I am? And they come at him with a few few answers. They say, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're a prophet. And he turns the tables on him and he says, okay, that's what everybody else says about me, but who do you say about me? And I just want to add in there, it's not important what anybody else in your family thinks about Jesus. It's not important what all the world around you thinks about Jesus. And if he did this or he did that, I had somebody say to me one time, well, uh, Jesus sat down with the disciples and smoked weed. I said, oh, really? Where'd you find that at in the Bible? He said, I didn't. My uncle told me that. I said, oh, your uncle told you that. You need to get in the word, dude. Well, it's an herb. So are you. (laughs) So all these opinions and ideas and who Jesus is, some say he's a good man, some say he's a prophet, but Peter had the right answer when he said, who do you say that I am? And that's really what's important is who you say Jesus is. And Peter jumps up and been made made many stakes before, but he thought, I'll give it another shot. And he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, bingo. And Peter's like, oh, drop the mic. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, he was always fighting with John and James, the sons of thunder. And I think he kind of just liked, liked to tout that a little bit, you know, that he finally got it right. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, you are Peter. And the word Peter is the word Petros, and in the Greek, if you were a Greek and you were reading it, you would read it like this, you are a sliver of the rock, and and as a part of the rock, Jesus says, and I will build my church on this rock, and the gates of Hades will not prevail. My church rocks. My church rocks. When we're talking about my church, we're talking about his church, the church that he's building. And he wasn't telling Peter he was building it on Peter. He was telling Peter that you're a part of this rock. Just like he would look at you and say, you're a part of this rock. When I first gave my life to Jesus, somebody went to the Christian bookstore and got me a little card that said Timothy on it. And the definition for Timothy is honoring God. And I thought that was so cool because that's what I feel like. I want to know God in the most intimate way and reveal him in the most accurate way. And so if Peter got a card, it would say a sliver of the rock, (laughs) part of the rock. And truth be knowing, all of us are a part of the rock. We're a part of this church that Jesus is going to build on top of. The rock. What is the rock? That's what's got me, because Jesus wasn't saying Peter was the rock. 
Jesus was saying Peter was part of the rock. So what's the rock? Well, the rock is the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what Jesus said. Who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, that's right, Peter. You're a part of this rock. And that's what I'm going to build my church on. The foundation of my church, the rock of my church is going to be this, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. However, that's only half the revelation. Because when I remember and recall the Lord's prayer, it's not thy church come, thy will be done. It's thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We've been robbed, primarily I think from the enemy and people who do not have an aspect of the kingdom in their theology where we've created whole churches on the basis of loving people, being nice to people, giving them a place to worship, making the, li- li- the lights nice, making the pews soft, making the temperature right, and we play this game called church. And unfortunately, we can get so infatuated with church that we don't realize that church was a means to an end. It wasn't the end of the means. Church isn't the end game. God never intended for you to give your life to Jesus and then sit here in your holy butt rut waiting for the rapture. That's not what God intended. God never intended for the church to be the stopping point, but rather to be the starting point. God intended to call people out of a people, bring them together, known as the church that meets inside of a church house. You're the church, not the building. And he wanted to grow you in the knowledge and the image of Jesus Christ and get the promises that are yes and amen inside of you. So that as we huddle here as a football team, we can eventually go out of here as a team into the kingdom where there's two conflicts, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of dark that are constantly clashing and we can advance God's kingdom. And as his word says, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now you can see what a tragedy it is when we make church the end all, we get people saved, we bring them here, we sit them here, and then we keep on tithing, we keep on praying, and we never do anything outside of the four walls. It's all a Sunday thing, not a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday thing. And and we make church this relic, this thing for a museum, this spiritual bus stop, and we never take it beyond the four walls and go out and do what we were supposed to do. It's like going to college for seven years and then never entering in to what you studied for. Somebody would think you're an idiot if you studied seven years to be a doctor and never became a doctor. Somebody's sitting in here going, that's what I did. (laughs) Dr. Pepper. (laughs) We go to church Sunday after Sunday after Wednesday and for gatherings and for prayings. For what? So we can say we went to college and then graduate when we get to heaven? God doesn't need us to drive out demons in heaven. There are none. God doesn't need us to heal sicknesses in heaven. There are none. God needs us to do his work now. God needs his kingdom that's there to come to here now as it is there. Tell my message. Come on, church. Bring the kingdom. Bring the kingdom. I'm going to get sweatshirts that say bring the kingdom. You'll wear it. All right, anybody buying? Let's do this. All right, we got some buyers. Bring the kingdom. Why? Because that was the intent in the church. Look what Jesus says. That you're right, Peter. I'm the Christ, the son of the living God. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail. One day I was praying and I was asking God to give me an acronym for rock. I thought there's something there. 
You know when you're reading the scriptures and you just know there's more there than I'm seeing? Peter saw it when Jesus said, that wasn't revealed to you by man, but by my Father. Peter got a revelation of who Jesus was. And Jesus goes, yeah, that revelation you got, Peter, that's what I'm going to build my whole church on. And so I asked the Lord, I said, God, give me something with this rock. What is this rock that you're building your church on? My church rocks. I'll never forget what he said verbatim. The revelation of Christ's kingdom. I thought, oh my goodness. It's not just the revelation of Christ. Yes, we need a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. But we also need a revelation that it's not just Jesus who's anointed. It's every one of his followers that are built on that revelation that will take that wisdom and go out into the world and advance his kingdom. The rock is the revelation of Christ's kingdom. It gives me my marching orders as the church. What do I do? I come here and I meet with you and we all together grow up into Christ, which is the head. We come to grips with who he is and what he does and his promises and his power and his anointing and his love and his faithfulness. And as we grow together in the knowledge and the image of Jesus Christ and we become strong and fitted, we leave this building and we go out into the marketplace and we take what we have and we give it to the world and we declare emphatically, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How did this kingdom thing get to going? Because in the very next verse, after he says, I'll build my church on this rock and hell will not be able to succeed against those who are built on the rock, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. One time I was really preaching. I was in Montana and I was preaching on the keys to the kingdom. And I was just doing the Billy Graham bowler. And I mean, you think T Pastor Tim gets loud here. Wait till I go somewhere else. Oh, there, somebody's nudging. How could he get any louder? He yells at us all the time. <laughs> Not yelling at you. I'm just passionate. And I was preaching in Montana. And I said, and Jesus will give you the keys to the kingdom. And the guy that brought me there, he was a pastor too. He had his arms crossed. He's listening to me. And he goes, and I'm like, that's not encouragement. Like, what's your problem, dude? So after the service, I walk up to him, and he goes, he goes that was a great message, but he, the Bible doesn't say keys to the kingdom. I said, yes, it does. He said, no, it doesn't. I said, show it to me now. And he opened up the Bible, and sure enough, I read it with my own eyes. It does not say keys to the kingdom. It says keys of the kingdom. Anybody got any keys in here? Oh, mom's ready. Whew. Check that out. That is a Subaru key. My goodness. It's like a Willy Wonka key right here. <laughs> keys are interesting because keys are a sign of authority. You could actually translate the word keys to authority. If my mom threw me these keys and said, here, Tim, take it wherever you want it. She just gave me authority to use this vehicle wherever and however I want. Now, if I rifled through her purse and took the keys to her car, then I better be looking for handcuffs. Jesus did not say, I will build my church on this rock and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, and I give you keys to the kingdom. He did not say that. If he were saying that, he would be inferring that I am giving you authority to get into heaven. The church doesn't give us keys to get into heaven. The church gives us keys to get power from heaven. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. Jesus didn't say, I gave you keys to heaven. He said, I gave you keys of heaven. <laughs> 
In other words, the same authority that God gave me is the same authority that I'm going to pass on to you if you build yourself on the revelation of Christ's kingdom. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's in me. Hallelujah. And the same power that healed people when it was with Jesus is the same power that will heal people when it's with me. And the authority that I have to do it by is because I'm built on the revelation of Christ's kingdom and I can say thy kingdom come and thy will be done and take my keys of the kingdom and unlock all of heaven into the kingdom of darkness and all those that are locked down on lockdown from the enemy in the kingdom of darkness can be set free because the gates of Hades will not prevail against me. Woo! I love it. But we got some dilemmas here. Number one, most people in the church today have no aspect for the kingdom in their theology. And like I said when I first started out, if you don't believe in the kingdom, then there's no relevance for church. In other words, there's no reason for you to be here today if there's no kingdom to be advanced. Because the reason for the church is to advance the kingdom. And unfortunately, we can't fit the church or the kingdom into the church. We can only fit the church into the kingdom. It's like trying to fit a school bus into a Honda Accord. It's not happening. But you can sure fit a Honda Accord into a school bus. And I'll tell you what, when we have an aspect of the kingdom of God, that when we walk out of these doors and out of these four walls, we are stepping into a war zone. And there's a kingdom of darkness that is advancing people, depressing people, holding them in bondage, holding them in addiction, holding them in depression, holding them in darkness. It's a mess out there. And my question is, will the real church please stand up? Because my church rocks. And will they stand up and aggressively go out and knock on the gates and say, you're not going to stop us and break down all the gates and pull people out of darkness and advance the kingdom until what's there is happening here. Jesus is not here in the flesh. He was And he did miracles, so many in fact, that John 21 says if they were all written down, there wouldn't be enough room in the world to contain the books. I've been to the Grand Canyon, that's a big hole in the earth, big tunnel, big ditch. And you're telling me that the Grand Canyon couldn't hold the number of books that could be written about the miracles that Jesus did? Jesus was a walking miracle, that's all he did constantly we we have about a month's worth of miracles that we read in the new testament in the five gospels but that's not all jesus did that's just some of what jesus did relevant to the message to be had but jesus was constantly doing these things and then when he's about ready to leave he says it's better guys if i go away and everybody's freaking out because they're like no you're the powerful one we're the pitiful ones if you leave we got nothing And he goes, oh, 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 pump your brakes. Don't worry. Fear not. If I leave, then I'll send you the Holy Spirit. And the same one that was in me will be the one that comes inside of you. Instead of one person walking the earth with the Holy Spirit in them, there will be a whole bunch of me on the earth. Because the Holy Spirit will be inside of all of you. And then he says this mind-blowing scripture. Greater things than these will you do in my name because I go to the Father. What? (laughs) And so what's Jesus do? He raises from the dead. He says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go. That's a tell. You mean you're not going to do it? Nope. I'm going to heaven. You're going to do it. And he did. He marched up to better corridors. He stood at the right hand of the Father. 
And the father said, sit down, my son, until your enemies be made your footstool. You don't sit down until you're done. Jesus' work is done. Everything Jesus needed to do was fulfilled. That's why he said, it is finished. He's done. The father said, sit down, you're done. Until your enemies made your footstool. I've struggled with that. Wait a second. Um, Scripture says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Anybody got a glider in here? An old, a, a grandma glider? Oh, come on. Yeah, Lane's got a grandma glider. You know what I'm talking about. The, the wood, and it's got the soft pillow that's usually maroon. <laughs> and you sit in it, and it's a glider, and it goes like this. Yeah, a glider. Right? Somebody's got a better name for it. And then, then the footstool goes with the glider. Right? The glider goes like this. And then this miracle happens when you put your feet up. Your feet go like this. Just a swing. Dun, dun. Gliding. Well, here's my problem. Jesus finished his work. Heaven is my throne. When Jesus went up to heaven and the Father said, it is finished, God said, sit down, my son, in your glider. Until... You get your footstool. Um, I got one question. If Jesus is done, and he's not going to do any more work, who's going to build the footstool? Heaven is my throne, but earth is my footstool. And when we put things under our feet, ultimately we put things under his feet. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on as it is. It's already done in heaven. Jesus is reigning at the right hand of the Father. There's no sickness there. There's no disease there. There's no demons there. There is glory and power and healing and love and joy. And Jesus is the king of heaven. And Jesus says, hey, what's going on up here? I want it to go on down there. Jesus does it there. The church does it here. Woo! And every time we take authority and put something under our feet, we put it under his feet. And when we finish our job, church, and we accomplish our assignment, church, we will be all able to bring this awesome gliding footstool under Jesus and say, here, my Lord, we have conquered the enemy because you gave us the leg up to conquer him. Now sit in your chair and tell your enemies they have been made your footstool. Woo! <laughs> That's a reigning church. That's a church that rocks. My goodness. Some people come to church because they like the music. Some people come to church because it's like a concert. Some people come to church because they feel more confident when they walk out because of all the bad things they did before. Some people come to church so they can... Get another golden star on their attendance. Way to go, attendees. Not mocking any of that. Some people come to church so they can feel a little bit of solace. I'm thankful that our church has all of the above. But the reason I come to church isn't for the music, isn't for the lights, isn't for the praying, isn't for the tithing. The reason I come to church is because Christ is the son of the living God. And my job is to become equipped in Christ and to bring his kingdom to the earth as it is in heaven. And as we come together as one body and unify under his presence, we're equipped to go out into the marketplace and make sure that the gates of Hades do not prevail against the world. The next president is going to be the hope of the world. And the last president sure wasn't. And we got to make sure we don't make it all about America either. It's real easy to be a Christian nationalist. 
where as goes America, so goes God. Excuse me. God's way bigger than America. And although the American economy might be shaking, God, we're a part of a kingdom that can and will not be shaken. Praise God. We serve a God. We have a kingdom. Hallelujah. Kingdom. Where does that come from? In America, with democracy and republic, we don't understand kingdom. We have no idea. We get to vote here. And that's why when the gospel message of the kingdom comes to people, they say things like, you can't judge me. I live in a free church. We have this attitude like we have a say in the matter. We got to vote. I'm sorry, honey, but God doesn't care about your vote. He is who he is, and he's going to do what he's going to do. And in God's kingdom, he's right. When you came to Jesus, one of you is going to change, and it's not going to be him. But thank God we're a part of a kingdom that can and will not be shaken, and God's kingdom is here for our benefit. When we come into alignment with his plan for our life and we begin to advance the kingdom like Jesus told us to, not only do we flourish in our church fellowship and we flourish in our lives, but we flourish in our relationships, we flourish in our minds, we flourish in our hearts because God's got our best interests at heart. So even though God is gonna make you lay down in green pastures, you ever read that? He maketh me. That means he says, you're gonna. Can you imagine a little calf come frolicking through <laughs> this, this briars and dirt and no grass, right? And, and the master goes over to the calf and grabs him by the halter and drags him through the briars and brings him to this gate that is just flowing with green grass. I mean, everything a calf could want. And instead of the calf running out into the grass and frolicking around and eating as much as he wants, he hunkers down even more. Like I saw something on Facebook that showed a guy in Jesus. And Jesus said, see those footprints over there? Yeah, that's where I carried you. And then he says, see that trench over there? Yeah, that's where I drug you. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine the, a calf should want to lay in green pastures but a lot of times we don't even know what's best for us we're so hung up on our depression and our addiction and all this and we keep wanting to go back to the briar bushes and the tumbleweeds for goodness sake and we're bucking and kicking to go back to nasty nothing when the whole time God's got a green pasture here, has our best interests at heart and he's pulling us like this and he's making me lay down. Oh, wow, this is great. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> You don't even know what's best for you. I always love what Pastor Gary said. He said, stop talking bad about yourself. Oh, I'm nothing. I never get anything. Nobody ever likes me. He said, Jesus bought you with his blood. He owns you. Stop talking bad about Jesus' property. Kingdom. In Genesis chapter 1, we see where God started this thing with kingdom. He didn't start it with church, He started it with kingdom. Church was God's resolution to preserve the kingdom. If you don't believe me, when God created Adam and Eve, He put them in a garden. Now, this wasn't a garden like what's over by Bacon Park. This was a place fully furnished by God to enjoy all of his awesomeness. And allow me to submit to you, it wasn't a garden as much as it was a kingdom. Why do I know that? Because the word kingdom is a derivative of two words, king's domain or king's dominion. 
If you give somebody dominion and you put them in a place and you mark out boundaries, that place that you put them in and those boundaries is the domain of a king. And so God makes a man, he pulls him out of a mess, puts him in the garden. You got to make sure God can take you and put you because he won't transgress your free will. And you might be kicking and screaming, but just surrender and say, God, take me and put me because he'll put you in the right place at the right time. And he says to Adam, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. That's king talk. Adam wasn't just a farmer. Adam was a king. God makes a garden. He puts boundaries around it. And he puts a man in it and says, I give you dominion over all the creeps. This was my favorite scripture when I was riding bulls. I'd get on a big, ugly, snorting, longhorn bull with his horns up like this, perfect size for my blessed assurance back here. <laughs> and I would sit down on that, and sometimes, I remember I got on a bull named Dodge Truck, and he was as wide as a Dodge Truck. I, my feet were like little wings out here. On, on the side of him. He had muscles in his ears. I mean, it, he was like, you want to buy some of these? Huh? 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 And I was scared, but I, I would always do this. I would slap that bull on the hump, and I'd say, I have dominion over all the creeps, and that includes you. And then I'd say things like, I didn't draw you. You drew me. God put Adam in the garden, and he said, take dominion over all the creeps. And Adam lost it in a perfect world. He had dominion and he turned it over to Satan. And he lost his dominion. Well, Jesus comes along to redeem, to restore. And when he dies and he raises from the dead, before he raises and goes to heaven, as he's just before he's ready to ascend, he says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go. In other words, I've got your authority back and I'm giving you your dominion. Now go reign in life through one Christ Jesus. You rule over all the creeps. Only this time it's not birds and cows and reptiles. It is that. That's why I could say that to the, it was a little out of context, but not completely out of context. I did have dominion over that bull. And I do have dominion over foxes and snakes and spiders. So even sometimes I don't act like I have dominion over spiders. I have dominion over all the creeps. But when Jesus came on the scene, he upgraded the version. He took the old laptop and put all brand new into it and said, now I am giving you dominion over all sickness, over all devils, over all bitterness, over all unforgiveness, over all depression. Come on, somebody, over all the addiction. I've given you dominion. Now rule. Stop letting it rule you and you rule it. All those creeps. Can't believe how many people put up with depression. Stop putting up with it and tread on it. Take dominion. Take authority and say, you have no authority over me. I will not be depressed. I'll be de-blessed. I don't even know if that's a word, but I just made it up. Amen. Dominion. Kingdom. Oh, you're going to like this one. There's a little scripture that says, He's the King of and the Lord of. Huh. I would say that all the time, quote it all the time. When I was praying, I'd pull my scripture pistols out, say, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I say every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
And it got so rote, like thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, we can get real slick with those prayers, can't we? Where we, do, we don't even know, we, don't even, we forget what they mean, we, but we've learned how to say them and memorize them. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Hallelujah be thy name. And we just, just lob it right out there. And we never take, take a consideration what we're actually saying. I mean, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's huge. What Jesus is doing there, the church should be doing here. King of kings, Lord of lords. King of kings, Lord of lords. King of kings, Lord of lords. One day, I can't remember if somebody turned me on to it or if it just was kind of like a, an epiphany moment. But I thought, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. King of, Lord of, who are the kings that he's king over? Who are the lords that he's lord over? Me! <laughs> Maybe it wasn't exciting for you as it is for me, but you mean he's the king of kings and the lord of lords, or we could say priest of priests, I'm a king and a priest of the most high. If I'm a king, then I have to have a kingdom. Because if I don't have a kingdom, I'm not a king. Cool. What's my kingdom? Kingdom of light. And I have dominion over all the creeps. That blessed me. Big time blessed me. And then I watched Jesus. He says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, just before he's ready to send out his disciples on their missionary trip to go preach the gospel, he says, oh, guys, before you go, I just got to tell you what you need to preach. I don't want you to preach on prosperity. I don't want you to teach a seminary prayer. I don't want you to talk about uh, healing or family ethics or tithing. Those things, that they'll come. That's in the epistles, but we're staying in the gospels right now. When you go into the world and you preach... This is the message I want you to preach. The kingdom is near. <laughs> Whoa. The kingdom is near. You mean that's it, God? That's all you want me to say? You don't want me to say God loves you or you're special or you're important? Yeah, that's part of it. You know, let people know you're special. Let people know you're loved. They shall know you're my disciples by your love. But the, the, the crux of the matter, the message that should be coming out of the church is there's a new king in town and his name's Jesus Christ, and you don't have to suffer under the authority of the creeps any longer. And then he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, drive out demons, cure those with leprosy, and look at the next verse. Just as freely as you've received it, turn around and freely give it. Wow! That's what the church is supposed to do. That's it. Hey, there's a new king in town. His name's Jesus. It might look a little different than that raw. It might be like, what's the matter? What's been going on? Oh my goodness, I've been in depression for six weeks and I can't seem to get out of it. I hate myself and I almost tried to take my life the other night. My, my boyfriend just split up with me and, and uh, I had this vodka in my upper... Uh, cabinet and I went and I, I never do this. It's been sitting up there gathering dust and I grabbed it and I just got sloshed and I was on the floor the next day and uh, the next thing you know the cops showed up at my house and they took my baby from me and, and I'm just a mess and I don't creep alert. Well I know somebody that can help you with that. Who? Who? You gonna take me to AA again? I'm thankful for AA, but 
there's a new king in town that's kicking the rear end of the old king. And you don't have to live under that any longer. And if he can set me free, he can certainly set you free. And I know it's a mess right now and life's a struggle and the struggle's real. I'm not gonna deny that. But I'm gonna tell you what, the same thing that's going on in heaven, God wants it right here on the planet. And there's no depression in heaven. There's no devils in heaven. There's no anger in heaven. There's no bitterness in heaven. And I'll tell you what, there's favor that can be released on your life. There's joy that can be released on your life. And all the promises in Christ are yes and amen. And you can get your baby back and you can get back on your feet again and you can get out of this depression and you can begin to reign in life through one Christ Jesus. Reign is kingdom talk. You can begin to reign in life through one Christ Jesus and I can help you do it. Let's get thy kingdom kingdom to come and thy will be to be done in your life as it is in heaven. And bust down those gates and break the grips of the enemy and jerk them out of there and pull them into church. And before you do that, think about giving their life to Jesus, getting them water baptized and filling them with the Holy Spirit, the keys of the kingdom. You can do that before you even bring them to church. But that's what it's all about. Well, I read this scripture in Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 10. Have you ever read a scripture over and over and over again and you just kind of put it off into the drawer of the, yeah, wherever that fits. Kind of like your junk drawer. We all got that drawer, don't we? It's got a thimble and some fingernail cutters and a paper clip and a rubber ball and two old rubber bands and a key that you don't know what it goes to anymore. (laughs) Some thread and a needle and your old YMCA pass. I just named everything in your drawer. (laughs) Oh, you forgot the velvet dog brush. Scotch shape. (laughs) We'll just stop right there. (laughs) Sometimes we can do that with the scriptures where we just kind of like, yeah, whatever, I'll I'll look at it later. I kind of did that with this scripture. And then when I started studying this series about My Church Rocks, I just got this revelation again of the reason for the church This isn't so we can have nice meetings and so we can have a social club for Jesus. This is an army being equipped. This is a college and a university. God loves to take diversity. That's why we're all different colors and shapes and sizes and we all think differently. We all have different pensions. But God takes us all and brings us together into unity. He takes diversity and brings it into unity and we get a university. The church wasn't primarily to be a hospital for the hurting. That's what the church was supposed to be out in the world is a hospital for the hurting. But when you come to church in the building, in the church house, it was supposed to be a college, a university that educates you as to your position in the kingdom so you can go out there and do it. A university, a place that unifies diversity and we all come together under Christ Jesus and grow up into him which is the head and then go and take what we've learned out into the marketplace. And as I read this scripture, I'm like, it couldn't be more plain. His intent was that now, when's now? Right now. Right now. So whoever read this, that God put in his word, they would know when I'm reading this, it means right now. Not back there in Ephesus, but right now. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Remember, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers, rulers, authorities in heavenly realms. You think you're fighting against your mother-in-law. No, you're fighting against what's behind your mother-in-law. You know you can set somebody free by what's fighting what's holding them in bondage. 
Don't fight the person that's in bondage. Fight the thing that's holding them in bondage. That's how you set people free. We're always fighting the people in bondage. We're always fighting the, uh, Goliath's armor bearer. The giant's the one we're supposed to be fighting. <laughs> Don't fight the addiction. Don't fight the problem. Fight the devil behind it. And his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom and power of God would be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. And then look at the next verse. It says, oh yeah, and by the way, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, that's, that was the eternal purpose for the church was that now we would reveal the wisdom and power of God to the authorities and powers that be against us right here on the earth. I don't know how we can get any clearer than that. That's awesome. You mean... Can I just put this together in a different Rubik's Cube position and match the color on the other side? Let me just say it the way I read it when I put it all in a different pattern here, same words. That the reason the church exists was so that God could now reveal his power and wisdom to the devil and all that are keeping them in lockdown and that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church as it reveals God's wisdom to those authorities and this was God's eternal purpose from the church from the beginning. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on church. Bring the kingdom. Whew. My goodness.